Welcome to the Chrome Enterprise Technical Community Hour. Today we'll be covering a recap of Google I.O. 2024. My name is Rich and I'll be your host for today's presentation. Joining me today, we have Damian Renzulli, who's a partner engineer for Chrome Enterprise. Today's Chrome Technical Community Hour is brought to you by the Chrome Enterprise Recommended Program, which is Google's partner program for third-party solutions that are optimized for Chrome or integrated with Chrome Browser. This webinar brings you the opportunity to engage with our team about new features and updates, enterprise development best practices, and our enterprise strategy. Now, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Demian and he'll kick us off. Demian. Thank you, Rich. So as Rich said, uh, my name is Demian. I work on the uh, Chrome Enterprise team. And today we're going to do a recap of our last edition of the annual developer conference at Google, which is called Google I.O. I.O. 2024 took place around two weeks ago, more or less. The main focus of the event was uh, artificial intelligence, but there were important updates on other areas as well, including web, Android, cloud, extended reality, and others. Uh, today, we are not going to talk about uh, product announcements, like updates on things like uh, Search, Maps, Gmail, etc. cetera. Uh, if you want to know more about those, I highly recommend to watch Sundar's uh, keynote. Uh, instead of that, our focus will be announcements that we think are important for enterprise, Chrome, and Chrome OS developers. Here is the main site when you can find the Google I.O. content across uh, the different areas. We'll be covering the web section today because it's the most important for the technical community, our audience, but that doesn't mean that there are no interesting updates in other areas. So we highly recommend to check those out as well. This is our selection of the talks that we found more interesting for uh, Chrome and Chrome OS developers. Uh, all of them are already available in YouTube if you want to check them out. We are going to do a summary of some of them, but uh, uh, we would highly recommend you to watch the entire talks to know more about each of the topics. Uh, to get started, let's go over some important updates uh, specifically for Chrome OS developers. On the talk, what's new in Chrome OS, we shared updates around two of our main initiatives, uh, Chrome Enterprise Connectors and Chrome Enterprise Recommended. In the case of CER, uh, the program has grown now to more than 80 solutions validated across a variety of tracks, including security and trust, virtualization, and kiosk and signage. And since last year, I.O., we have added 15 new solutions and integration, including Avaya, Cisco Umbrella, and WorkSpot. We have three major Chrome OS-specific updates that might interest uh, most of you. The first one is the brand new Add to Chromebook batch, which works with both uh, PWAs and also with Android apps. Uh, you can add this batch to your site right now to let people know that you can use uh, your app in Chromebooks. Um, what is this batch about? So in the past, folks could only install your PWA if they were already uh, in your PWA inside the browser tab. That restriction is now gone for Chrome OS users. So with this new batch, people can install your PWA from your home page, marketing page, an app listing page, etc. So basically, anywhere users can find your PLA becomes a place uh, where they can install it. But the batch is not only useful for PLA. So if you have uh, an Android app, which is the best version of your app for Chrome OS, you can link to that. So it's going to take users to the Play Store instead. So basically, the batch is useful for both things. If you have a PLA, it's going to allow you to install directly from there. And if not, it's going to take you to uh, a Play Store listing so you can do complete the installation process there. This is how the batch looks like uh, in a real site. Uh, in a similar way to how other well-known batches are presented, such as Google Play. Uh, we're also introducing new 
Chrome OS app URLs you can use with these batches to link directly to your app. This is what I was talking about before. Um, that way, if, for example, the user clicks on the Add to Chromebook batch for the Android app uh, with this URL, they will be directed to the Play Store. And if not, they can directly download the PWA. These are some of the companies that have uh, either already implemented the Add to Chromebook batch or are in the process of doing so. Uh, and if you are interested in implementing or using this batch, you can find more information at chromeis.dev slash batch. The second uh, important update that's mostly specific for Chrome OS developers is the new tab PWA mode for Chrome OS. Uh, this allows installed PWAs to simply open uh, external tabs right in the same window instead of using a Chrome tab in the nearest instance of the browser. Uh, so basically in the past, if you wanted to actually uh, let users click on a link and open a tab, they were redirected to the browser uh, with tab PWAs. You don't need to do that. They don't need to, to move away from your experience and a new tab is going to open uh, next to the main uh, standalone experience. Uh, we're going to see an example right now. Uh, it's available today in Origin Trial, and we are looking to fully launch it around Chrome OS 126. Here is how Figma actually uses it. Uh, they implemented this feature to allow their users to use tabs to quickly access multiple files at the same time. So think about a use case where you need to do something like this. And if you do, you can now apply for the Origin Trial and uh, use it right away. And the last of the Chrome OS specific updates had to do with Chrome OS.dev, which is the developer site for Chrome OS developers. We continue adding content and different features to the site. Uh, I'm going to especially mention the new releases section where you can find the latest information around each Chrome OS release. Uh, this is something that developers many uh, times ask for uh, where they can find where the releases for the next Chrome OS version, for example, in one single place, and we didn't have such a thing. So if you go there now, you can follow all the updates uh, at uh, Chrome OS .dev slash releases. Now let's start moving into more general updates, uh, more about the web and Chrome, not specific to uh, Chrome OS. To get started, uh, this is an interesting update on uh, PWA usage from uh, directly from Chrome Data. Uh, we are seeing hundreds of millions of monthly web app or PWA users uh, is up by two thirds year over year. And there are more than 20,000 desktop apps with thousands of weekly users. These stats are important in the case that you have invested in PWAs or you are considering investing in PWAs and you are wondering uh, if it's a technology that's going to uh, continue being used in the future or if it's the best option for you. Uh, I think it's very encouraging to see these numbers, especially growing. Um, and today we are going to focus on some updates that are going to help you to continue enhancing your PWA or web app experience. Uh, to see if these numbers continue continue growing. So moving into specific API updates. Um, a while ago, we announced uh, same document view transitions, which is what you are seeing here. Uh, this is basically a web technology that enables smooth animated transitions between different states or views within the same web page. Uh, this is um, achieved by leveraging the uh, View Transitions API uh, combined with some CSS to choreograph the transition effects. But this is actually same document. It means that in the same document, without moving to a different URL, you could achieve all these effects. Um, here's an example of the same document view transition implemented by Airbnb. When you can see um, the, the smooth effect uh, when you are uh, using the web app, it looks really like uh, an immersive uh, experience, more similar to what native apps can do. 
But the new thing that we have recently announced is that view transitions now work across different documents. And this is super, super useful uh, because traditionally, when you build a web app, the most widely used architecture is multi-page applications. This means that whenever you have to move across different URLs or documents, there's going to be a full page refresh. Uh, if you want to achieve something more like smooth, you have to do something like a single page app, which is what, for example, Shimmel uh, apps have. Basically, downloads all the logic when you get into the web application, and then it's going to update different DOM elements to show uh, when you are navigating uh, in the different parts. But right now, thanks to cross-document view transitions, you can achieve similar effects, but actually across different documents. So you don't need to actually re-architect your uh, multi-page app to make it look like a single page app. You can use these effects to achieve something similar. Um, if you want to check that out, uh, this is the URL when you can find more information about it. For those interested in diving deeper into the latest, like more granular APIs, uh, there was a talk called What's New in the Web by Rachel Andrew. Um, and in that session, she uh, shared different updates around CSS, HTML, browser technologies, and for example, some of the new CSS selectors, uh, innovative DOM elements, and other uh, powerful APIs like compression streams for uh, optimized uh, data transfer and declarative shadow DOM for component encapsulation. As part of that talk, also, we announced the new web platform status dashboard at webstatus.dev. Uh, this is a highly improved version compared to the previous uh, one that includes several interesting features. Uh, for example, here you can see more detailed uh, interoperability status, which is something that the different browser vendors are collaborating on. Um, and also there are some features that are very, very cool and interesting. For example, this one allows you to follow the timeline of an API uh, and the different stages we go through. So for example, we mentioned some APIs that are in the origin trial phase. And you know that APIs usually go through different steps because they become generally available. So this view allows you to follow all the process in a very simple way. Uh, so this is not like a pretty big announcement, but I think it's very important. Uh, I use these things uh, frequently uh, as a web developer, so I think it's going to add a lot of value. To close like this section around more like web stuff, uh, there were some updates around Project Fugu uh, that, as you know, is the project that encompasses all the efforts to bridge the gap between native applications and the web. The first one has to do with file system access that now is used on a variety of very cool applications and PWAs out there like VS Code PWA. So up until now, permissions were limited to a single session, which means that every time you open, for example, VS, VS Code PWA, you have to authorize the PWA to go to your file system. Uh, right now, uh, the good thing is that you can allow on every visit, which make it persistent and obviously much more useful. So I think this is going to be great for PWAs that use uh, the file system to allow, uh, allow users to manipulate files, for example. Another interesting update around the file system management is uh, file system change observers, which is um, the technology that uh, Google Photos, for example, use and allows you to observe, for example, uh, a folder. Uh, and whenever something changes inside of it, you can like receive a callback and react to the change and show something that changed to the user. Uh, this is super, super useful, especially in these cases when you're using or showing the content of the, of the file system. Uh, the case of Google Photos, I think is very clear, but also for the previous one, like you are showing a tree of files like VS Code and you want to keep it up to date whenever something changes uh, out there. Uh, one more update has to do with window management. So traditionally, web applications were confined to a single browser window. Uh, you could use, for example, window open, uh, which gives you some control, but uh, was blind to multiple displays. So thanks to the window management APIs, you can now control and manage windows across uh, multiple screens, 
you can do things like resize, uh, enumerate, another important thing. So if you have an app that has like a primary uh, window and then you have pop-ups that you need to control in a certain way, check this out. More updates about uh, input output for the web, for example, Bluetooth, Serial and audio are in this talk, which is Unleash the Web, build almost any app in your browser, which is uh, a talk that delivered by our PM, uh, Penelope McLahan. So if you go and uh, check in the, in the list of the talks and you want to know more, you can go there directly. Uh, before moving into the AI uh, updates, I wanted to share something about WebAssembly because there was a very cool talk that uh, Thomas Natestad and Thomas Steiner uh, delivered around uh, this technology that uh, sometimes we uh, receive questions from. Uh, I don't know if many of you are using it right now. I know many applications that do it. The first thing to understand what is the power behind WebAssembly is that, you know, when you build an app, you have different ways of doing. Uh, one is to build an app per platform and you can compile the app for each of the, uh, the platforms specifically. And the other approach is to do something that's cross-platform. In this case, you usually build the code, write the code once, and then use an intermediary to run the code in the different platforms. This is something that uh, was a goal for computing, computer science for a long time. Uh, if you remember uh, Sun with the right ones run uh, everywhere. But now, thanks to WebAssembly, we are getting into a situation when this could be uh, achieved. Um, at Google, uh, we used WebAssembly for things like the C++ uh, code that powers uh, some features like the background blur uh, or the alter background in Google Meets. So as you can see, if you can run uh, C++ code, which is highly performant in the browser, you're going to be able to achieve uh, this type of, of features. Um, Thomas Steiner in that talk uh, shared a very cool example where he wrote a library that has to apply filters to, to photos, like, you know, this photo sharing, sharing apps. He wrote it in C uh, and C++, and the resulting code, he used it across the different platforms. So you can use that code uh, in iOS by using an interface layer. You can use uh, that code also in Android via the native development kit. And finally, in the web, by using mscripten to uh, uh, use as a compiler tool chain for WebAssembly. So this is uh, a great way to reuse your logic when it's very critical, and highly performant across different platforms. Um, companies like GoodNotes, uh, Google Photos in, in, in the case of Google uh, and others uh, used shared code in this way to reuse parts of the business logic. And you can even shared UI logic. So you can actually write your UI once and make it run into different platforms. This is less uh, something that we see less frequently because uh, obviously the result of this is going to be higher or more heavier uh, bundles uh, and also might not have access to all the features that you need. But if you're interested in knowing more about Web WebAssembly, Check this out. You might have some use cases that could greatly benefit from that. And the talk around WebAssembly was uh, highly recommended. Now let's jump into the AI updates. As you know, artificial intelligence has been a very important uh, topic during I.O. with all the announcements around Gemini. Uh, we are going to cover two different aspects of AI um, in this talk, and we are getting to the end of it. Um, the first one has to do with how AI can help you as a developer to actually be more efficient. And by the end, we're going to cover some uh, ways in which you can use AI inside your app. So um, we have seen a talk that Adi Osmani shared about the AI developer workflow. Um, actually, the goal of the talk is to help you to improve or become more efficient as a developer by using these tools, but not uh, making AI replace you in any way. So don't worry about that. Uh, there were very interesting stats about the usage, the usage of these things. Uh, for example, this one, 
uh, AI can improve a software engineer or knowledge workers productivity by up to 40 to 50 percent. And something that was uh, pretty interesting to see is that uh, according to surveys, 44 percent of the developers are already using AI tools in their developer uh, development workflow. So yeah, we're going to see some examples of these tools that were announced. Um, in this case, you can use different things, right? So you can use, uh, if you want to chat and receive answers to questions, you can use Gemini uh, Advanced. Uh, if you want to integrate Gemini with your application, you can use the Gemini API. And finally, we are going to show a little bit about the uh, Gemini uh, Code Assistant as well. So uh, starting with some specific examples, this is the simplest one when you can ask Gemini a question about coding and it's going to reply with a snippet of code that you can use and some guidance on how you can use things. Uh, another interesting one in this case that's integrated into VS Code is the autocomplete. So if you see here, days until Christmas uh, function and actually suggested a whole bunch of code to solve that task. That's actually pretty useful. Um, Adi also shared in that talk uh, an example of how he migrated a web app from one language or framework to another. So for example, if you want to migrate from, uh, let's say, React to Angular or vice versa, AI can help you doing that. And here, getting into IDX, which you can also uh, check out at idx.google.dev, is actually an ID that Google has developed that helps you to achieve like a lot of the tasks for uh, any ID in the cloud. Actually, it's a web-based ID and contains a lot of these AI features that you can use. This is a good example of a chat uh, that's integrated next to the editor that you can check out and ask questions about things very easily. Uh, this is a very cool example about code generation, right? So here, what you are doing is declaratively asking to do something. Uh, for example, refactor to use Node's Promise API. And as you can see, it takes the code in the left and generates the code in the right. So this is pretty cool. Um, these are some of the links. If you want to know more about these tools to improve the workflow as a developer, um, and you can start using right now. And getting into the final of this kind of a uh, quick summary about I.O., uh, there was a very interesting talk about on-device AI for web developers that uh, Kenshi, our PM, delivered with Mod <coughs> from the developer relations team. It's highly recommended if you want to uh, check out. The talk actually goes through different of the developer pain points around uh, using uh, large language models today. Uh, one of them is to actually try to use a meaningful use case. And we found that a lot of developers are still in the early stages of this exploration. Uh, there is some uh, uncertainty because sometimes the results that you receive from these models are not predictable. So how you are going to be integrating something in your app that's going to respond differently for different users in different times that sometimes creates some uh, uncertainty. And the other thing that we found is that developers really want to build stuff using AI, but many of them are not very interested in training these models. Um, Another very common question is if AI logic or code should be run uh, on the device or on the server. As you know, you have tools to do it in both sides, actually, and each of them <coughs> have their pros and cons. In the case of the on-device AI, some of the benefits that you have to run these models and logic on the client uh, had to do, first of all, with the sensitive data, so you don't need to send anything to the backend. Everything is going to be on the user's device. Uh, so if the user don't consent or they, they don't want to your applications to be receiving this information, that's something that you can provide to them. The other thing has to do with latency. Obviously, you don't have to go to the server to solve these things. And obviously, you're going to have uh, greater availability because by running these models on the client, under any condition is going to be uh, possible to run them like offline, whatever, and also expanding because maybe some uh, in some cases you can provide some backend AI to users, so you are going to be able to reach out to more. Um, 
things to consider before running something like that or using AI on device is what is the hardware that you're going to be running this? Because some hardware might not be compatible to these things. So you have to have a, a graceful fallback strategy in these cases. Uh, think about use cases that really add value, not just using AI because it's cool and it's the latest. Uh, it's going to take work to implement and it's going to take resources either from the user's device or your backend. So think about it very, uh, very well. And finally, um, think about the pros and cons of these of the different approaches, right? So um, try to preserve the user experience by avoiding very big downloads or even weak caching strategies that are not going to serve you in the long term for these things. Uh, during the talk, uh, they shared an example where there is something like a product listing for a backpack, and they wanted to be able to receive a summary of the reviews so they can know about the usefulness of this product and what the users think about it. So the goal that they had was actually very simple. Here you have uh, the result. They wanted to create a summary of all the reviews. This could happen in an e-commerce site or something like that, where they have the, the average is going to also give you the, the summary of what the users think about the product and then divide it into positive and the negative highlights. This, uh, the goal of, um, of Kenshi and Mod in this case was to run this on the client and see if it was possible. Uh, for that and for the different aspect of that solution, they use a different model. In this case, TensorFlow.js, Transformer.js, and then Gemma. Uh, and they compared what were the results with each of them. Um, at the end, some of the conclusions, the good things about using on-device AI had to do with the fact that you didn't need any AI or machine learning expertise. It worked really fast and also it was pretty accurate. Um, but the problem is actually that having to fetch these models to have them running in the client was, was pretty expensive uh, because you know the average page size is around two megabytes and the models were more than one gigabyte. So that was the main drawback from using these techniques. In any case, uh, one important thing to consider is that the Gen AI models are going to continue shrinking, or possibly there are going to be models that are going to be adapted to specific use cases. This is going to enable more on-device uh, AI applications. But uh, a thing to keep in mind when using this technique is try to have a combination, right? So maybe you can do some of the processing in the server and some of the client, or you have a technique to kind of uh, gracefully degrade, right? So you can always provide something in the client and whenever that's not possible, uh, you can go to the server or something like that. Uh, this is another example where this was done. And yeah, I think that's pretty much it. We had more talks obviously, and these talks have to do with different things. I would highly recommend you to watch the one around Chrome Web Tools, which uh, shows you some of the integrated AI tools that are right now uh, for, for uh, debugging, for example. There was a talk about um, navigating the JavaScript framework ecosystem. That was very interesting uh, about performance. And then we have updates around privacy and other topics. Uh, in my case, I delivered a talk ar around test automation uh, that might not be like the coolest topic, but it's a very important one. And we covered uh, things like Puppeteer or WebDriver, and even things that you need to always keep in mind. Like we talked about a lot of new features today, how you can test the upcoming features. Uh, so we also cover things like the different Chrome channels, which is something that you can use to anticipate the changes. Uh, we are going to have uh, one specific session around this in one of the upcoming technical community hours. And this is the final list of the talks. So these are all the talks that we picked for you around Chrome, Chrome OS, and in general about the web. So if you want to check it out, and I think that's pretty much it. So uh, back to Rich right now. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much everything I have. Thank you, Damien. Uh, in closing, please visit the Chrome Enterprise Developer website for additional information and uh, developer articles. That concludes today's webinar. Thanks for joining, and we look forward to seeing you at the next one.